A very good evening and welcome to the news tonight. We hope uh, you've had a proud and happy Republic Day. And in fact, here on the show in the next 30 minutes, we'll be getting you a recap really of all the celebration that we saw today, not just in the capital, but also all across the state. And of course, uh, look at all the other top stories as well. I'm Tracy Shilshi and here are the headlines. India showcases military might and rich cultural heritage at its 67th Republic Day Parade. Bomb-filled spectacle features for the first time a French soldier contingent. Parades and celebrations held across the nation. Governors unfurl the national flag and watch colourful cultural programmes with tableau highlighting achievements of their states. President Pranam Mukherjee confers the gallantry awards to the armed forces personnel. 365 people honoured, including posthumous Ashok Chakra winner Lance Nayak Goswam. President Pranam Mukherjee approves the central rule for Arunachal Pradesh. Supreme Court to hear the Congress's petition against government's decision tomorrow. And in sports, after setting a winning target of 189 runs in 20 overs, India win the first T20 match against Australia comfortably by 37 runs. Top story, Arunachal Pradesh was placed under President's rule today, a day after Home Minister Rajnath Singh presented to President Pranam Mukherjee the government's clarifications for recommending it. The Congress, which was in power in the state, had challenged the Union government's decision in the Supreme Court. The hearing of that will take place tomorrow. The BJP justified the action, saying that the centre had to intervene because the crisis in Arunachal Pradesh amounted to violation of the Constitution's Article 174.1. It prescribes there that there shouldn't be a gap of more than six months between two sessions of a state assembly. The Congress also asked other opposition parties to back its allegation that the centre wanted to undermine or remove non-BJP governments. It was expected that they will, uh, by forcefully they will do it. It was expected they did it. And then it is, uh, of course, uh, not uh, wise decisions for the state of Arunachal Pradesh. And ultimately our people people will be sufferer. This is the Arunachal Chief Minister नबम टुकी और स्पीकर नबम रिविया इन दोनों जो कजन ब्रदर्स इनके वजह से आज अरुणाचल को ये दिन देखना पड़ा ये बहुत अनफॉर्च्युनेट है ये प्रेसिडेंट रूल इनफैक्ट बहुत पहले लगना चाहिए था अक्टूबर नवंबर से ही ये क्राइसिस आ गया सरकार माइनॉरिटी में है वहां कानून चीज की कोई नहीं है डेवलपमेंट चीज के कुछ नहीं है वहां पूरा खत्म हो गया लॉ एंड ऑर्डर प्रॉब्लम पूरा वहां हो रखा है well, this is an issue that's been snowballing into a bigger controversy tomorrow. Of course, Supreme Court to hear that petition of the Congress. We'll keep an eye out for developments. Meanwhile, uh, let's talk about the Republic Day celebrations. And the country, in fact, celebrated its 67th Republic Day on Tuesday with a ceremonial parade at Rajpath. In fact, French President Francois Hollande attended the event as a chief guest. He later left for Paris later in the evening. The parade this year was held amidst unprecedented security in the wake of the attack in Pathan Court. And here are more details. The grand spectacle of men in crisp uniforms and strict military discipline marching across Rajpath, inspiring patriotic fervour across the nation. India celebrated its 67th Republic Day on Tuesday with French President François Hollande as the chief guest at Rajpath in the national capital. Early this morning, Prime Minister Narendra Modi greeted the nation, saying he salutes all great personalities who framed our constitution. Prior to the commencement of the parade, the Prime Minister led the nation in paying tributes to martyrs at Amar Jawan Jyoti.
He was greeted by Home Minister Rajnath Singh and MOS VK Singh on reaching Rajpath. Then Vice President Mohammad Hamid Ansari arrived. He was received by Prime Minister Modi. This was followed by the arrival of President Pranab Mukherjee and his French counterpart Francois Hollande. And His Excellency Francois Hollande, the President of the French Republic, being greeted very warmly by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The parade began with proud winners of the highest gallantry awards who followed the parade commander at the majestic Rajpath. <laughs> The parade was a spectacular affair with many firsts seen this year. A 76-member French army contingent led by a French military band consisting of 48 musicians marched down Rajpath. The first time a foreign army marching down the Rajpath along with the Indian troops. moment for the French president. And right behind them we have the military color party. In French the six soldiers in two rows of three are called the Guerre de Drapeau or military color party. This year the parade saw the return of four-legged troops with 36 dogs of the Indian Army and 90 camels of the Border Security Force joining the march. Army had chosen 36 dogs for the event to make a comeback after a gap of 26 years. The canines are trained in jobs like detection of explosives, guarding, playing a vital role in saving lives of the soldiers. The parade saw India's military might on display, including Akash, the first indigenously developed weapon system, powerful Brahmos missile and Indian Army's main battle tanks T-90 Bhishma. Tableau from 17 states and six central ministries and departments presented the varied historical, architectural and cultural heritage of the country. The tableau of the Indian Navy displayed INS Vikrant, while the Indian Air Force's tableau showcased its human assistance and disaster relief efforts. Bihar's tableau presented the Champaran Satyagraha of Mahatma Gandhi in 1917, while Jammu and Kashmir's tableau displayed the concept of rural development through technology. This was followed by a colourful display of dances by students from various schools in Delhi. Like every year, Army Jawans showcasing dangerous bike stunts was the main attraction of the parade. The Indian Army's motorcycle stunt team, the Daredevils, again doing a fine balancing act this year, drawing thunderous applause from the audience.
This was followed by much-awaited Indian Air Force's thundering aerobatic professional skills with Sukhoi 30, MiG-29, Jaguar combat planes, C-130J Super Hercules transport aircraft. The Republic Day saw unprecedented security in the wake of the attack on Pathankot Air Force Base. A high alert was sounded in Delhi with at least 40,000 security personnel keeping a close watch. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. और कर्तव्य की उत्कृष्ट भावनाओं को दर्शाती शानदार गणतंत्र दिवस परेड का भव्य समापन हुआ. Well, President Pranab Mukherjee also conferred 365 gallantry and other defence awards to armed forces personnel and others. President Mukherjee conferred the Ashok Chakra posthumously to Lance Naik Mohan Goswami, who laid down his life fighting militants in Jammu and Kashmir. Lance Naik Goswami of the Special Forces took part in back-to-back -back operations in Jammu and Kashmir, which resulted in the death of 10 terrorists in 11 days. 25-year-old BSF Jawan Rocky is the lone recipient of the Shorya Chakra among all paramilitary forces this Republic Day. Rocky has been awarded the medal posthumously. The Shorya Chakra is the third highest gallantry award in peace times after the Ashok and Kirti Chakras. He received the award for his bravery while thwarting a terrorist attack on a BSF convoy in Udhampur in Jammu and Kashmir last year. The awards also include four Kirti Chakras, 11 Shorya Chakras, 48 Sena medals, four Norsena medals, 29 Param Vishisht Seva medals and 118 Vishisht Seva medals among others which were conferred by the President. And the 67th Republic Day was celebrated with great enthusiasm across the country in several states. Parades and celebrations were held in state capitals with respective governors unfurling the national flag. Here's a report. Vibrant parades, colorful cultural programs, and tableau highlighting achievements of states marked Republic Day celebrations on Tuesday. Governors in state capitals unfurled the tricolor at various events across the country. In Jammu and Kashmir, the celebrations passed off peacefully amid tight security. Divisional Commissioner Kashmir Asghar Samoon took the salute at the Bakshi Stadium in the presence of PDP Chief Mehbooba Mufti. Despite the bone-chilling cold, the function saw a good turnout. In Punjab and Haryana, parades were held at several district headquarters and joint capital, Chandigarh. Haryana Chief Minister Manohar Lal Khattar unfurled the flag in Gurgaon. मुझे बहुत ही गर्व और खुशी का अनुभव हो रहा है राष्ट्रीय पर्व के इस पावन अवसर पर मैं आप सबको हार्दिक बधाई और शुभकामनाएं देता हूं इन लखनऊ गवर्नर राम नायक प्रिसाइडेड ओवर द रिपब्लिक डे फंक्शन इन महाराष्ट्र द मेन फंक्शन वाज हेल्ड एट मुंबई शिवाजी पार्क where Governor C. V. Rao took the salute. Various units of the Indian Navy, Indian Coast Guard, CISF, State Reserve Police Force, Mumbai Armed Police, Mumbai Women Police, Mumbai Fire Brigade, National Cadet Corps, Road Safety Patrol, Bharat Scouts and Guides took part in the lively march pass. It is a day to reaffirm our commitment to strengthening the ideals and democratic values and is fine in the Constitution. Down south in Karnataka, Governor Vajubhai Wala hoisted the flag and said the nation should not forget its diversity, which he said is the basis of our journey towards progress. In Tamil Nadu, Republic Day was celebrated in the presence of Chief Minister J. J. Lalita, Governor K. Rosaya hoisted the flag and watched the march past. Traditional dance performances and tableau showcase the state's culture. In Kerala, the Republic Day function was held at the Central Stadium in Trivandrum, where the national flag was unfurled by Governor P. Sadashivam. In his speech, the governor said, the functioning of the Kerala Assembly should be made more efficient.
request all of you to kindly rise. In the east, in West Bengal, the tricolor was hoisted by Governor K. N. Tripathi, who presided over the march past of armed forces and the police forces at the Red Road. Tableau portraying the state's heritage were the highlights of the program that was also attended by Chief Minister Mamata Banerjee and her cabinet colleagues. In crisis hit Arunachal Pradesh, Governor J.P. Rajkhua hoisted the national flag and gave a call for a corruption-free administration. <laughs> Celebrations were also held in all nine districts of Manipur without any major untoward incident despite boycott calls and general strikes. Chief Minister Okram Ibobi was the chief guest at the main function held at Kangla, where over 100 contingents and tableau participated in the parade. Celebrations were witnessed along the border as well, where Indian and Pakistani troops along the line of control exchanged sweets. Pleasantries were also exchanged between security forces at the India-Bangladesh border. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. With that, a quick break here. We'll be back with more news. Stay with us. The present government is being projected as, as a reflexive anti-Dalit government. I, I think that kind of a criticism is uh, inspired by those who are not comfortable with the present government. The politics in Jammu and Kashmir, why do we see a an intriguing political silence at the moment, both on the part of BJP as well as uh, PDP. So there's an English proverb that we'll cross the bridge when we reach it. Let the party first choose its leader. The PDP is yet to choose. Watch to the point with Minister of State for Prime Minister's Office, Dr. D.P. Indra Singh, only on Rajya Sabha Television. Welcome back. Now let's talk about cold wave conditions that prevailed in the entire North Indian region with minimum temperatures falling several notches below normal. Not just cold, thick fog as well affecting normal life. Train services were the worst hit. The unusual cold weather pattern disrupted normal life in the East Asian Peninsula. Here's more. Winds travelling from the northwestern plains increased the chill factor in North India as the country celebrated Republic Day. Bone-chilling icy winds have disrupted normal life, sending shivers all around. In the hills, the minimum temperature is hovering at freezing point in the lower areas, while higher areas are reeling under temperatures as low as minus 10 to minus 12 degrees Celsius. As many as 8 deaths have been reported in the past couple of days due to the intense cold wave in Uttar Pradesh and West Bengal. Jammu too experienced its coldest night in 70 years, at 0.05 degrees Celsius. इस समय ठंडा तो बहुत ज़्यादा देख रही है और ठंडा बहुत ज़्यादा है हाथ हाथ पैर गल रहे हैं और अभी कुछ सुबह सुबह कोहरा भी बहुत ज़्यादा था। काम करने में हाथ फट जाते हैं और काफी ठंड से हाथ भी सिकुड़ जाते हैं। हाँ गर्म कपड़े टोपी वगैरह तो पहने रखें फिर भी ठंड लगता है। a thick blanket of fog engulfing the entire northern region has brought down visibility to 200 meters in Delhi. Flights and train services are also badly hit, with as many as 45 Delhi-bound trains cancelled and 30 delayed, while seven are rescheduled. Not just India, the entire East Asian Peninsula is reeling under a severe and unusual cold weather pattern. This rare weather pattern has specially proven deadly for Taiwan, where 65 people have died due to the cold. Heavy snowfall in Japan has stranded motorists, delayed bullet trains and caused flight cancellations. The southern city of Guangzhou in China, which has a humid subtropical climate, saw snow for the first time since 1967. In South Korea, temperatures in the capital Seoul fell to minus 14 degrees Celsius, the lowest since 2001. On Saturday, Jeju Island received 4.7 inches of snow, the heaviest since 1984. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. The Maharashtra Police uh, today foiled a temple entry plan by a group of women in Ahmednagar district. 
The women were trying to break the 400-year-old tradition at the Shani Shingnapur temple by entering its sacred sanctum that is barred for women. They were stopped at a village 70 kilometers from the shrine. Scores of police personnel formed a ring to foil their march towards the famous temple. The tense showdown ended with the activists being taken into custody and later released. Time now to take a look at what else made news across the country today in a segment nationwide. A militant was killed in a gun battle with security forces in South Kashmir's Anantnag district. The police handed over the body to the relatives of the rebel from whom an AK-47 rifle was also recovered. Search operations are still on to look out for any other militants. Three members of the NSC and Kaplang surrendered to the Nagaland State Government Authorities. The Assam Rifles organized a homecoming ceremony for the separatists and presented vocational toolkits to help rehabilitate them. NSCNK is one of the several separatist groups in Nagaland active in the remote and underdeveloped northeastern region bordering China, Myanmar, Bangladesh and Bhutan. Separatist groups in Jammu and Kashmir today called for a complete shutdown across the state as the country celebrated its 67th Republic Day. The shutdown call was given by leaders of several Kashmiri separatist groups including the hardline Hurriyat Conference Chairman Saeed Ali Shagilan. International news now. In the much-awaited Syria peace talks might restart on Friday. The UN is making an all-out effort to secure a broad ceasefire in the war-torn country. Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry dismissed reports that he threatened to stop support to the Syrian opposition if they did not turn up for the talks. Here's more. The first priority will be the focus of the talks of what most Syrians, if not all, want to hear. The possibility of a broad ceasefire and the possibility of stopping the threat of ISIL. The United Nations making a push to restart the postponed Syria peace talks. The Geneva communique will be the guideline for the talks. It was issued after a UN-backed conference on Syria held on June 30, 2012, laid down a roadmap for power transition in Syria. Everything is uh, starting with the Geneva communique what we have on 2254, which lays down very clearly three areas, governance, new constitution, and new elections under UN supervision, is a further refinement and more precise of what could be the umbrella of, of the Geneva communique. The UN has finalized the list of delegates on behalf of the Syrian government and the opposition. However, the head of the Syrian opposition is not optimistic about the upcoming talks, casting further doubt on whether the group will attend the Friday meeting in Geneva. Meanwhile, the US Secretary of State John Kerry said they will support the opposition politically, financially and militarily. He also dismissed reports that he threatened to halt support to the opposition if they do not show up for the talks. Russia remains adamant on its stand on Syria as it reiterated that their military intervention had altered the ground situation in the war-torn country. Действия воздушно-космических сил России в ответ на обращение сирийского правительства реально помогли переломить ситуацию в этой стране, помогли обеспечить сужение контролируемого террористами пространства. The Syria peace talks were set to begin in Geneva on Monday, but it got delayed because of the ongoing discussions on who should represent the opposition. On the ground, the situation remains grave. At least 22 people were killed in a twin bomb attack in Syrian government-controlled city of Homs. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Right, now let's head on to some cricket news. And after losing the five ODI match series 4-1 against Australia, Team India celebrated Republic Day today with a stunning victory in the first T20 in Adelaide. India really defeated Australia by 37 for runs India. to take a 1-0 lead in the three-match series on Tuesday. Australia well, were all out for 151 up, runs in 19.3 overs. Debutant player Jaspreet Bumrah picked up three wickets while Ravindra Jadeja, Hardik Pandya and R. Ashwin took two each. Ashish Nehra picked the wicket of Kane Richardson. 
Earlier, Virat Kohli made an unbeaten 1955 balls, while Suresh Raina made 41 and Rohit Sharma 31 runs to help India reach 188 in 20 and now let's get you news from the ninth day of the Australian Open and top seeds Novak Djokovic, Roger Federer, Serena Williams and A. Radwanska muscled their way through the quarterfinals on Tuesday to reach the semis, while Chinese player Zhang Shui became the first women's qualifier since 1990 to reach the quarters. Swiss top gun Roger Federer advanced to his 12th Australian Open semi-final on Tuesday with an efficient victory over sixth seed Tomas Burdich. Federer's last major victory came at Wimbledon in 2012. Looking for his 18th Grand Slam title, the world number three looked close to his brilliant best as he brushed Burdich aside to win 7-6, 6-2, 6-4 on the Rod Laver Arena. I'm competitive at the top. I can, you know, beat all the guys on tour. Um, maybe the slam or not. Uh, it's nice now that in the last three slams I've been as consistent as I have been. And uh, I'm playing good tennis, fun tennis for me anyway. I really enjoy um, being, being able to come to the net more again like back in the day. And uh, um, so I'm very pleased and it would mean, mean a lot to me, no doubt about it. Federer will now face defending champion Novak Djokovic in Thursday's blockbuster semi-final clash. Djokovic, a five-time winner at Melbourne Park, accounted for Japanese seventh seed Kei Nishikori in the late evening session, winning 6-3, 6-2, 6-4. Tactically well prepared uh, for the opponent tonight. I was feeling good on the court, uh, striking the ball better. Um, he wasn't feeling physically maybe 100%, but still, you know, he was he was playing quite quite fast, and I had to had to be aware, had to be um, pretty quick, um, you know, on the baseline rallies, and I've done I've done well. In the women's draw, world number one Serena Williams domination continued as she hammered Maria Sharapova to reach the semi-finals. The reigning champion has not lost to Sharapova since 2004 and she is now unbeaten in 18 matches against the Russian after winning 6-4, 6-1. She will now face Poland's Agnieszka Radwanska in the last four. Williams, who stands two wins away from a record equaling 22nd Grand Slam title, said the Russian brings out the best in her. I mean, she's an incredibly intense, focused player who, you know, was number one and has won so many Grand Slams for a reason. So, um, you know, when you're playing someone like that, that's so great. You have to come out with, you know, a lot of fire and intensity. Earlier, fired up fourth seed Agnes Karadwanska blasted into her fifth career Grand Slam semi-final with a dominant straight set mauling of Carla Suarez Navarro. The Spanish 10 seed was no match for the composed pole, whose never say die attitude helped her dictate the physical encounter 6 1 6 3. I think it's good, especially that um, um, I did semi finals here and I won the tournament uh, before, so um, couldn't be any uh, better so far. Meanwhile, China's Jung Shuai became the first women's qualifier since 1990 to reach the Australian Open quarterfinals after beating a hobbling Madison Keys 3-6-6-3-6-3. The 133rd ranked Jung struggled to control her nerves in the decider but eventually held it together to set up a quarterfinal against unseeded Britain Johanna Conta. The last qualifier to reach the Australian Open quarterfinals was Mexico's Angelica Gavaldon in 1990. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. And as India celebrated its uh, Republic Day today in Australia, it was Australia Day. So we're leaving you with all those celebrations.